For today's tutorial, we will be learning about first aid. First aid is any treatment that we provide to a person who has suddenly fallen ill. A first aider is someone who provides first aid. The goals of a first aider will be, number one, to alleviate pain, prevent further injury, prolong the life of the person, and lastly will be to help promote recovery. One of the most common equipment that a first aider should have in his first aid kit is what we call a triangular bandage. A triangular bandage is also known as an all-purpose bandage, mainly because it has a lot of uses. I normally use the CP Cash CTS acronym for me to memorize and remember what are the uses of a triangular bandage. CP means cover and protect wounds. Letter A stands for it can be used to absorb body fluids. S and H stands for that it can be used as a support. It can use it can be used to support and hold body parts and the dressing in place. C means it can be used for compression or direct pressure. T stands for it can be used as a means to tie splints. And the last letter, which is S, stands for it can be used as a strap to a spine board. So what are the different parts of a triangular bandage? A triangular bandage has different parts and the one that I'm holding right now is what we call the apex. Or another term for it will be the top of the triangle or the tip of the mountain. Now, these parts are what we call the tails. For it to be specific, the tail that is on my right hand is what we call the right tail. And the tail on my left hand is what we call the left tail. The distance between the two tails is what we call the base. The distance between the apex and the right tail is what we call the right side. The distance between the apex and the tail on the left hand, our left tail, is what we call the left side. The center part in the middle is what we call the center face. Moving on to the different terms that we will be encountering while we're performing the different techniques for bandaging. The basic knotting technique that we normally use for triangular bandaging would be what we call the square knot. I tell my students, for them to not get confused in doing the square knot, the key thing to remember would be to have the working ends pointing upward or the tails should be in a thumbs up position. As an addition, by the way, the three points in, a, in our triangle or any part of the triangular bandage that we connect together is what we call, we can also call it as a working end. So the right tail and the left tail, once we connect them, we can, consi we can consider them as working hands. So in the thumbs up position, the first thing that we have to do is to remember the formula right over left, left over right, or vice versa. Left over right, right over left. For you to not get confused, what we can do will be to start first learning how to tie our knot starting from the right side going to the left side. After you have mastered that, you can practice tying your knot starting from the left side moving to the right side. So for now, so that we will not be confused, my advice would be to first tie your square knot starting from the right tail moving to the left tail. 
So one of the basic terms that you will encounter in load management is what we call crossover. Okay? So you will not be making any mistake in doing your square knot. Right tail should always be on top of the left tail when we do our crossover. So when I say crossover and overhand loop, that means once we cross over both our tails, we move our left tail to our right hand and our right tail on our left hand. The tail which is on top of the other tail is the one that will be creating a wrap. So that is what we call the overhand loop. Some students normally make a mistake in tying their square knot because they are performing an underhand loop instead of an overhand loop. That means the tail which is at the bottom is the one that they are wrapping on the tail which is on top. So for you to not make a mistake, again, thumbs up position, right tail should always be on the top of the left tail. When we, when we perform crossover. Then we will be performing what we call the overhand loop, which means the tail which is on top is the one that we will be making a round turn or a wrap. And it is the one that we wrap onto the left, left tail. Another turn that you might encounter while we're performing the techniques is what we call the twist. So when, once I say crossover and then twist, this is what I mean. Another term is what we call the fold. So you're folding. Okay. So now let's try to complete the square knot technique. So crossover, right tail should be on top of the left tail. Transfer the left tail onto your right hand, the right tail will now be on your left hand and you will be performing a round turn or overhand loop on the left tail. Then once I say properly dress your knot, that means we will try to tighten it up, not too tight, not too loose. And that's what we call properly dressing your knot. Now, the next step is to cross over again and the right tail should always be on top of the left tail. So crossover, we have the right tail on top, then create an overhand loop, and then properly dress your knot. From there, you will see that we have created a knot in the middle, and there's an open part and a closed part. You can actually pull on both sides. But depending on the, the cloth that you're using, there's a probability that the tie or the knot will not be loosening up if the cloth is not uh, as soft as the one that I'm using. So our suggestion will be for you to be able to perform the quick release, try to look for the open part, and then go to the working end. So from here right now, this is the left tail. Moving to this direction, so what I'll do, I will hold the left side and then try to pull my left tail. And as you can see, we now have the square knot tied properly onto our left side. So the right tail is tied on our left tail. So we can easily release and easily tighten up our knot. So that is our square knot. So for our next topic, we will learn how to maximize the use of the open face techniques for basic first aid and wound management. In definition, a bandage is any clean cloth that you can use and apply to help someone was an open wound. And when we say any sterile cloth, that is pertaining to a sterile cause bandage. The rule of 
outcome is that we have to maximize the mentality of the two lesser evil concept. Meaning, the goal for first aid will be for you to go back to the three basic objectives, which are again, alleviate pain, prevent further injury, prolong the victim's life, and then promote recovery. So for example, if the bandage is dirty, can we still use it or not in applying first aid? Worst case scenarios, we would want to maximize the use of our working hands in applying first aid to in applying first aid to a person who got injured. So, using a dirty bandage to a person who has a bleeding injury, severe bleeding injury, would be a lot better than letting him bleed to death over getting an infection because of using a dirty bandage. So, the idea here, the idea here is do the lesser evil. Losing a lot of blood can lead to what we call the hypovolemic shock. However, getting an infection can still be treated within 24 hours. So which is better? You losing a lot of blood can lead to death and hypovolemic shock or getting an infection that will be treatable within 24 hours. Of course, it's more on the infection. Okay, for this presentation, I'll just be giving you an overview of the different classification of wounds that you might encounter while using the techniques that we will be learning for bandaging. So we do have two cl basic classifications of wounds. One will be open wounds and the other will be closed wounds. For me, to be able to memorize most of the different wounds that we might encounter while applying the triangular bandaging techniques, I make use of the LISA above acronym. So we have the lacerated wound, incision wound, stab wounds or puncture wounds, abrasion wounds, avulsion wounds, burns, and open fractures. The laceration wound is usually a kind of wound. It is similar to a cut that produces irregularities. Usually, this can be caused by broken glasses or any blunt object that penetrated or has injured the skin. The incised wound is normally an injury, a form of cut that produces a clean cut due to the object that has been used, such as, for example, here, as you can see here, we have a, a surgeon's knife. A stab or puncture wound is any penetration inside of the skin. The rule of thumb in dealing with stub or puncture wounds will be anything that comes in should not be pulled out and any part of the body that comes out should not be placed back in. The idea here is that if we try to pull out this object for example it might cause severe bleeding and add additional pain to the victim which breaks the rule of thumb from where we should not be adding injuries to the victim and adding pain to the victim. An abrasion wound is one of the most common injuries that we might encounter. As you can see here, it's a penetration to the first layer of the skin. An avulsion wound here, here's an example of an avulsion wound wherein the skin has been totally ripped off. Burns can be also considered as open wounds. The only treatment that we normally give to this um, type of injury will be we want to cover it against infection. We do not apply compression. Other types of wounds that we might encounter will be closed fractures or dislocations. For the first technique, what we will be doing is to apply first aid to an open wound on the top of the head. So the first thing that we have to do is talk to, to the victim and then 
assess his mental capability to answer back to your questions because we are actually assessing his me mental awareness after a certain incident. In that way, you can be easily able to identify on whether the person has any concern about mental awareness because 90% of people who die in any form of vehicular accidents are commonly caused by brain damage. So for this first injury, the head top side technique is going to be applied because what we have here on top of the head would be an abrasion injury. So the first thing that we have to do would be to clean up the wound. Then afterwards, we can apply what we call a sterile gauze bandage. And because we don't have any medical tape, we can actually maximize the use of our triangular bandage to keep the dressing in place. So, what we have to do is to fold the base inward at least one to two inches. Then, place it on top of the forehead of the victim. Then, cross it over on the knee. Sir, can you just move? And turn around. So when you say cross it over, we are not going to perform a loop. We will just cross over on the knee. Sir, can you just turn around? So from here, what we're going to do, we'll be crossing over again on top of the forehead. And remember, it comes at position. Then, right leg always on top of the left leg. Then create an overhand loop. Then cross over again on the right tail on top of the left tail. Overhand loop once more. Then hide the excess part of the triangular bandage. The reason for this is so that it will not be a cause of delay in case that we will be needing to transfer the victim and there will be certain obstructions along the way. No parts of the triangular bandage may be clipped on those obstructions that can cause the triangular bandage from getting removed from the victim. So from here, what we want to do is to keep the technique neat and clean. So what we're going to do here is to hide some of the excess and then if you feel that there's a need to add additional tension here, let's say for example, there are stacking here, one of the ways to prevent severe bleeding will be to apply direct pressure. So what we can do, one of the uses of the apex is so that it can be used to add additional tension. So what we can do here, we can pull the apex down to add some additional compression on top of the injury of the victim and then pull the base then hide the apex like this way. So this is what we call the head top side technique. Probable injury will be an abrasion on top of the head of the victim. The next technique that I'll be showing you is what we call the burn face injury or the back of the head injury. For this next technique, the probable injury of the victim will either be a burned face or a lacerated wound on the back of the head. So the first thing that we can do is to tie the knot, an overhand knot, on our apex. So, create a loop and then just 
Let's insert your working end, and this is what we call an overhand knot. Key things to remember, if the injury is a burn injury, we do not apply compression. Our main goal will be to cover and protect the wound against infection. So if this is a burn face injury, what we're going to do is we will just be covering the wound so that while we're transferring the victim, it will not get infected. So the first thing that you have to do is to estimate the length and the size of the bandage. Then, what we normally do if we need to cover the face will be to cut some holes parallel to the eyes, to the nose, and to the mouth so that the victim will have a means of breathing and being able to see while we're, while we're transferring the victim. Then, what we have to do here is to place the apex just in between on the top of the head. Then, hold the base. Normally, we are talking with the victim and we can give the instructions to the victim, Sir, can you please put two fingers below your chin? In this way, the victim will not be strangulated. The goal here is not to add compression, so we actually don't need to apply too much pressure. So from here, I will cross over. My advice to my students when they're doing this technique will always be to have the square knot in a visible location so that it will be easily removed by the responding physician. So again, we perform the square knot, thumbs up, position, right over left, not too tight because this is a burn injury. Again, cross over, then hide the excess part. And then what we can do here is to just hide the apex. Similar to the burn face injury, what we have to do for a back of the head lacerated wound injury will be to hold the apex, create an overhand knot, then what we want to do here because there is bleeding will be to use a dressing to absorb the body fluid and cover the wound after we clean up the wound. And because we don't have a medical tape, we can maximize the use of our triangular bandage so that we can keep the dressing in place. And then afterwards, we fold the base. It will be a lot ideal if you have someone, like a body, who can assist you while you're performing this, while he's adding compression. So from here, again, similar with the burn face technique, will be to instruct the victim to at least put his two fingers below his skin, then cross over, And then tie your knot in a visible, easily visible area. Right over left, left over right. Then hide the excess part. And if there's still slack here, for us to be able to add additional tension, we can maximize the use of our apex. Pull it up and then twist to add additional tension. This is what we call the back of the head technique for a lacerated wound located on the back of the head. So for the next technique, this can be applied for four point of references. When I say point of reference, that is the location from where the injury is located. So it can either be 
on the right chest, left chest, right back, or left back. So probably probable injury will be a perforation on top of the chest or on top of the back. So if there's bleeding, again what we have to do is to apply dressing so that it can absorb body fluids and then apply compression. If the victim is conscious, you can talk to the victim so that he can assist you in applying compression. But more ideally, you ask for someone, a bystander, a family, or a relative to assist you in making sure that you keep the dressing in place while you're performing the triangular bandaging technique so that someone will be applying the right pressure. So here, the apex, again one of the purpose of or use of the apex will be to indicate the point of reference of the injury of the victim. So if I place it here, that means the probable location of the injury of the victim is on the right chest. If I place it here, probable location of the injury of the victim is on the left chest. If I put it here, it means that the probable location or the point of reference of the victim's injury is on the left back. If I place it here, point of reference will be located on the right back. So in this case, we have the injury located on the right chest. So we place the apex and we want to make use of the triangular bandage to keep the dressing in place. So from here, what I'm going to do is to fold the base just below the chest line. Okay. Then after folding the base, to keep the dressing in place, you can ask the patient or another rescuer to apply compression while you're performing the technique. Sir, can you please apply pressure on your right chest? From there, I will now be folding the right side moving to the neck area of the victim. So from here, we now have three working ends. Sir, can you please turn around? What we can do here is we can tie both, of, both tails, thumbs up position, Crossover, right tail always on top. Then again, do the square knot. So from here, we can now tie the apex to one of the tails. Right over left, right tail always on top. Then, Hide the excess parts. Sir, can you please turn around? Here, for you to be able to add additional tension, you can actually fold So this is what we call the chest or back injury technique. Probable injury can be a perforation on the chest or an open wound on the back of the victim. So for this next technique, we can apply this to a person who has an injured arm. This is what we call the arm sling. So again, one of the purpose of the apex is so that we can indicate what or where the point of reference is located. So in this case, the victim has an injured right arm. So what we need to do is to place the apex near the right elbow. If the injury is on the left hand, what we have to do is to place the apex on the left elbow. So now, in this case scenario, the victim has a right broken arm and it is bended. So as much as possible, of course, you have to talk with the victim, try to build rapport, and ask him what
what will be his condition? Is he feeling pain? Um, because some students normally ask, Sir, what should be the right position of the arm if it's an arm sling technique? Should it be in a 45 degree angle? Or should it be in a 90 degree angle? My common answer to students who are asking that question will be, we look for or we identify if the victim or we identify if the victim is comfortable in that position and that's where and that's when you will be applying the technique. The only case scenario that we maximize the use of a 45 degree angle position will be if there's an open wound on the forearm because we have three distinctive ways on how to stop severe bleeding. Number one, again, applying the right pressure. Number two, elevating the body part. And number three, will be to apply pressure on supplying arteries. So we do have a lot of arteries, as we all know. We have temporal, carotid, radial, brachial, femoral, popliteal, and posterior tibial arteries. So if the bleeding still not stops, we can actually apply pressure on the supplying arteries. So in this case, he has a broken arm, right arm, so we place the apex on the right arm or near the right elbow. So from here, I will be folding the base, moving to the neck area of the victim, making sure that the fingers are exposed and is on top of the triangular bandage. Then, we try to support it by placing the other end of the tail on the other side, on the bad side of the victim, meaning it is the side that has the injury. And again, I will tie my knot in a thumbs up position, right over left, left over right, and then hide the excess parts. Some nice instructors will tell you that you should try to create an overhand knot on the apex. You can actually also apply that. But for me, I can just try to twist it to add additional support. Now sir, <clears throat> what if the victim has an injury on the collarbone or on the shoulder together with the arm? So what we can do here, instead of using the arm sling technique, we can maximize the use of the underarm sling. Because we don't want to add additional pain to his injured arm. So what we're going to do here, instead of applying the arm sling technique, I will be inserting the tail or the bad tail under the armpit of the victim so that we won't need to add additional weight on the injured shoulder or collarbone of the victim. And then do the same procedure. Perform the square knot. Right over left, left over right. Then add additional support by twisting the apex and then hiding it. So those are the arm sling technique and the underarm sling technique. So for the next technique, this is a technique that we can apply for both hands and feet. This is what we call the burn hand or foot technique. We consider burn injuries as major if it is located on the face, the hands, the genitals, and on the feet because those are the location from where circulations can be found. So, if a person has a burn hand, what we do, we maximize the use of the triangular bandage so that we can cover the wound against infection. So we don't need to apply compression. We have three different positions of the hand. It can be letter A, letter B, and letter C. So what we can advise our victim is to make sure that either he uses letter A and letter C. The purpose of this is so 
that we won't need or the hands or the fingers will not be sticking together after the burn injury has occurred. Normally what we do before we apply the technique, we make use of a separator. This can be any sterile material that is not sticky and we separate the fingers from one another. The reason for the letter C um, position of the hand is because this can be used in a lot of ways. It can be used for opening doorknobs, it can be used to get a bottle and drink a bottle. So, in terms of usability, the letter, letter C position of the hands is what we advise. And the letter A position. So, how do we perform the open face techniques for a burned hand injury? Hold the apex and then place the base near the near the wrist of the victim and then we try to cover the burned area. Then the next step will be to fold both sides then cross over just be sure that you're not tying the knot too much or not too tight because this is the an area for circulation. This is where the radial pulse is located. So we just try, what we want to do here is not to apply compression. What we want to do here is to just cover the wound against infection. So right over left, left over right, and then hide the excess part and use the apex to cover it. And then bring the victim to the nearest hospital for further treatment.